I hope you enjoy the talk that's about to start. Um, just a minor housekeeping thing, just to remind everyone the Tuesday night meditation group is going to be combining with the Wednesday night. So there'll be no more Tuesday night meditation for a while. Um, in case you're planning on attending, just make sure you show up on Wednesday instead of Tuesday. Well, I'm going to pass it on to Doug, who's going to do the prayers. So give me one moment to get that up, and we'll get going. Thanks. Hung or Jan Yulji Nub Chang Sam. He ma ge su dong po la ya chen chok ji nu jub ni pe ma jung ni je su drug kor du ka dor man po kor ke ki je su dog jub ki jin ji lop chir shek su so guru pe ma si di hong Hong or Jun Yul Ji Nub Chang Sam Pe Ma Ge Sur Dong Po La Ya Chen Chok Ji Nu Drub Ni Pe Ma Jung Ni Je Su Drug Kor Du Kadror Mang Po Kor Ked Ki Je Su Dug Drub Ki Jin ji lob chir shag su so guru pe ma siddhi hong hong or jun yul ji nub cham sam pe ma ke sur dong po la ya chen chog ji nub drub ni pe ma jung ni je su drug Kor du kadror man po kor, ke ki je su dog drub ki, jin ji lob chir shek su so, guru pe ma siddhi hong. Hong, on the northwest border of the country of origin, in the pollen heart of a lotus, you attain marvelous, most excellent city, renowned as the lotus born. You are surrounded by a circle of many dakinis. As I practice following in your footsteps, I pray that you approach to confer your blessings. Guru Pema City Hong. Hong, on the northwest border of the country of origin, in the pollen heart of a lotus, you attained marvelous, most excellent Siddhi, renowned as a lotus born. 
you're surrounded by a circle of many Dakinis. As I practice following in your footsteps, I pray that you approach to confer your blessings. Guru Pema Sidi Hong. Hong, or on the northwest border of the country of origin, in the pollen heart of a lotus, you attain marvelous, most excellent city. Renowned as a lotus born, you are surrounded by a circle of many Dakinis. As I practice following in your footsteps, I pray that you approach to confer your blessings. Guru Pema Siddhi Ho. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who are wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom, like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust. Matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, field of ocean-like merits and good qualities. To the thus gone, I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning. To the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field, holy field, endowed with good qualities. To the Sangha also, I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, Homage to the Dharma Refuge, homage to the Great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage, to all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms atoms in all aspects, with supreme faith I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action. Commit, accumulate virtue and goodness, subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Dharma, in the Buddha. 
I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen. And may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth, and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my yadams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Idam guru ratna manalakam niratayami. The Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time, the Bhagavan was dwelling on massive vultures mountain on Rajagriha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara. How should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, said this to the venerable Shariputra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage, who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, Compositional factors and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, ignorance no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, 
cessation, and path, there is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reached the end point of nirvana. As the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equaled to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering, should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared, teeta gate gate, para gate, para samgate, bodhisoha. We'll repeat this 21 times. Teeta gate gate, para gate, para samgate, bodhisoha. Teta gate gate para gate para sam gate bodhi soha. Shariputra, the bodhisattva, mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the bodhisattva, mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said. Well said, son of the lineage, it is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagas rejoice. The Bhagavan, having thus spoken, the venerable Shorivadaputra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Doug. Thank you, Doug. It is like that. Uh, all right, so. I'm going to talk about Yeshe Sogyal. Thank you for coming. Uh, oh, yeah, I guess I should say who I am. I'm uh, Dirk Johnson, uh, Yeshe uh, Sanglam, and one of uh, Yeshe Jinpa's students. Uh, this, this talk. Uh, I know that Connor Connor needed a slot filled, <laughs> so so I did it, and I didn't maybe spend as much time on it as I would have liked to have. But the entire talk, uh, from my point of view, just leads to a single question that I'm going to ask at the end, and so I hope we can have a lot of uh, discussion as a result of that. I'm going to I'm going to present quite a bit of material here but I'm going to go through it rather quickly so that we can get to the uh, discussion at the end and uh, this this PDF that I'm going to present uh, I, I'm happy to provide a copy of it to you I'll put it in the uh, on the website under happenings when I catch up to everybody's talks and happenings. But before that, I'm happy to email you a copy also if you want one, just let me know. So 
So uh, first of all, let's start with, I'd like to start with the, I know we've done a lot of prayers for some people, but uh, the 15th Karmapa, because Yeshe Sogyal is usually associated with the Nyingma, but here we have the 15th Karmapa, uh, a prayer from the 15th Karmapa that I actually recite every in my daily practice uh, in a different translation. But this one is on the on Lotsao House, so it's public domain, so I, I'm using this one. Samanta Bhadri, the Dharmadhatu mother of all Buddhas, supremely kind soul mother who protects the Tibetan people. Chief Dakini of great bliss, you bestow the supreme city, Yeshe Tsogyal, to you I pray. Grant your blessings so that all outer, inner, and secret obstacles may be pacified. Grant your blessings so that the gurus may live long. Grant your blessings so that this era's disease, famine, and warfare be pacified. Grant your blessing, so that evil sorcery and spells may be overcome. Grant your blessing, so that my lifespan, glory, and wisdom may increase. Grant your blessing, so that all my wishes may be spontaneously fulfilled. So this is the thing about... Uh, Yeshe Tsogyal, talking about Yeshe Tsogyal, is that immediately we are taken to the highest levels of teachings. Uh, when we talk about Yeshe Tsogyal, we're already, just by mentioning her name, we're already talking about Dzogchen. We're automatically not talking about the fundamental level of teaching anymore. And so uh, it's hard to talk about her, uh, in Tibet, she, you know, uh, many people talk about uh, uh, Milarepa as the first Tibetan to attain enlightenment, but from the point of view of the Nyingma, uh, it was Yeshe Tsogyal who was the first native-born Tibetan to attain enlightenment. So it was actually a woman, and not a man. And also now to discuss her, because because she is so bound up in what's called the Terama tradition of the Nyingma school, uh, to, 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 and because all of the information we have about her come from uh, Terama treasures, uh, I'm going to start just with a quick discussion of Terama itself. Uh, and I'm taking this uh, discussion from Tulku Tondrup's Hidden Teachings of Tibet, an explanation of the Terama tradition of Tibetan Buddhism. I've paraphrased and rewritten and stuff, but so just quickly speaking, terma, ter, tercho, you'll sometimes see termas as the plural, but I, I, I always leave it as terma as plural. Uh, some people are inconsistent and sometimes they use it terma as, terma as plural and sometimes termas as plural. Uh, so it's a dharma, tre a, a terma is a dharma treasure, a hidden treasure. And there are treasures of text, relics, and so forth, the uh, transmissions. If you're interested, you can read this later. I'm not going to just read it to you because otherwise you wouldn't need me at all. Uh, but, oops, sorry. And a teratan is someone who discovers uh, the terma. Uh, uh, the, the thing about the, they discover them, of course, in the form of texts and relics. Sometimes they're, they're uh, statues or, or, uh, ritual implements, things like that. Uh, the thing about the Nyingma version of uh, per perception of terma, well, actually, let me go on the order that I laid it out. There's there's a general idea of terma, which is this this discovery of the, that the dharma is always there. The dharma is always present. Some of, most people, most beings uh, never see, can see dharma at all. They won't even see it if you teach it to them. But then there are other beings, they're realized beings, who see it and everything, see Dharma and everything they encounter. And then there are others who see it in the few things they encounter, and others who see it in the teachings themselves. So, this is this conception of terma itself as a general concept is very broad. But in, in the Nyingma system of terma, which is usually how terma is, if you hear the word terma, it's usually the Nyingma system that's being talked about. Uh, Guru Rinpoche and his consort, we'll get to her being his consort later, but his consort Yeshe Tsogyal, 
uh, established that terminal system for the new, I'm, I'm flashing back and forth because I'm looking at you in the text back and forth, just so you know. Uh, they, they concealed uh, these terma, as did some of uh, Guru Rinpoche's other students. And uh, Vimal Namitra wasn't really a student of Guru Rinpoche. He was a, a, an enlightened master himself and held independent Dzogchen lineages. But Vimal Namitra, uh, Nankai Nyingpo, a whole, a whole, whole lot of uh, his 25 students, uh, Guru Rinpoche's 25 closest students, uh, concealed these terma throughout Tibet you know, as actual pieces of uh, you know, texts and so forth. Uh, but the deeper meaning of terma is from the Nyingma concept is that Guru Rinpoche implanted these teachings in the mind streams of his students. And that in later incarnations, there are things that triggered the realization of these things that are implanted. And those are the, ter those are the treasures that are found. And the terma themselves are almost always highest yoga tantra. Uh, I can't think of a single one that's not, but, yeah, but you know, chances are there is. And they're always discovered by reincarnations of the close students of uh, Guru Rinpoche. And, uh, so there are three types, basic types of terma. One is the earth, earth terma, and that's you know when somebody goes and they they. Like uh, the Tertan Sogyal uh, is known to have gone to a lake, a frozen lake, and drilled a hole in the lake with everybody protesting against him for doing it because it was so dangerous to go out there at all. He digs a hole in the, he punches a hole into the frozen lake and he dives into it. And he comes out with the statue of Guru Rinpoche. <laughs> so it's like that. Those are the earth, earth treasures are like that. Sometimes they'll find him in a deep rock face of a cliff or whatever. Um, sometimes the whole text, uh, in any case, even those texts, when they're discovered, those earth treasures are still an encoded message that really is just there to, to evoke the teaching that was placed into the Tertan's mind. The termas are actually very rigorously vetted, you know, to see whether or not they're authentic and if the teachings are authentic. And if somebody tries to start saying that they found this teaching that, you know, that other uh, masters believe to be erroneous, they'll say that it's a false terma. And then there's the mind terma. And most of the termas that we encounter are mind termas. Uh, and as it's see once again it's that the the scriptures are the, these are these are implanted in the mind streams of the students They're, and and when when the trigger for that is happens they write they write they write the text down usually it begins though with the kini script and the kini script i'll show you a, a segment of the, the kini script here shortly but not right now they decode the teachings using from the kini script um, and then there's, oh, well, that's my typo. Notice I said two mind terma, two, two pure vision. That should have been three pure vision. Uh, pure vision is an, another type, and almost all of, all of the schools, certainly in Tibet, have pure vision uh, teachings. In the Nyingma school specifically, though, a, a pure vision teaching is not just one that's uh, taught in a vision, let's say, like, like, uh, I hate it when I go blank on, on things that I know really well. <laughs> uh, okay, there's Nagarjuna, and then, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I just went completely blank. But uh, there, there, are, there are teachings that come in visions, like the, the teachings of Maitreya and the seven tre treasures of Maitreya. Those are, those are pure vision teachings. And so that's a sutra level of teaching. But in the Nyingma, the pure vision teachings that are considered to be terma are highest yoga tantra teachings, and they are specifically teachings that are revealed by uh, reincarnations of disciples of Guru Rinpoche uh, as uh, terma teachings. Uh, there's a complete list of terma 
if you know there's if would is not possible to find a complete list. Uh, there is the uh, Rinch and Terzo that was, uh, its term was collected by Jangan Contro Lodro Taye. Uh, and that's a, an empowerment that's given every now and then for the, for the entire, for the entire thing takes many days for that empowerment to be given because it's such a large collection of texts. I think I think it's usually a month. I don't remember for sure. Okay, so now with that little background of the terma, here is the uh, sources for the biography of Yeshe Sogel. Primarily, there are two, and then there are many short ones. One of which I'll I'll, I'll give you the first few verses of one by Jangong Contro. Uh, but the two primary ones, actually the primary one, is this one. The literal translation of the title of it is The Lute Song of the Gandharvas, Revelation in Eight Chapters of the Secret History of the Life and Enlightenment of Yeshe Tsogyal, Queen of Tibet. And that was written down by Gawa Chongchub and Namkai Nyingpo, originally spoken uh, by Yeshe Tsogyal to them. And they wrote it down, and then it was discovered by Taksam Santan Lingpa, and Taksam Santan Lingpa's is believed to be an incarnation of Sogil's disciple, Gawa Changchub, who was her, her consort after, this is later after Guru Rinpoche had left Tibet. And he was her student and her consort. And uh, so, you know, Gawa Changchub was an incarnation of her former companion in a previous life also. It was discovered in about 1650 of the Common Era, originally encoded in Dakini script, uh, as all of the termas are. This was a mind terma. Uh, when, when the Dharmapalas prompted him, they said, there's something that you need to find. And uh, he, when, when that happened, uh, he recalled this treasure from his lifetime. And on, on the, on the, trend, on the uh, Tibetan text, this Dakini script that you see below, there's, there's, there's stuff like that all of the way through the text. Looks like I cut off part of it. Sorry about that. But it wouldn't make much more sense probably unless you're a Teraton anyway. And then the translations of this lute song of the Gandharvas, uh, the first one I read was the one in the middle, and the one that's most well known is the one in the middle. But in 2012, the Padmakara Translation Committee did The Lady of the Lotus Born, The Life and Enlightenment of Yeshe Tsogyal. Uh, Keith Dauman did his translation in 1996, which is about when I read it. And then I found the older translation, Mother of Knowledge, Enlightenment of Yeshe Tsogyal by Tartang Tulku. All three of those are translations of the same text. Uh, that text, the first half of it's very easy. It's just her biography and it rolls along. You know, she did this, this happened and that happened, and, which I'll get to in a bit. But most of the text is going to be very difficult for you to read because it's very high teachings. Actually, it's pretty advanced all the way through. And that's also true of this uh, next text, which is an earth terma. This text has a really interesting, uh, really interesting history. Uh, this one was originally told by Eshe Tsogyal to one of her students, Bende Sangye Eshe. And this was buried as an earth tre treasure. And uh, in the 14th century, around 1357, Adakini gave Dream a Kunga a list of treasures, saying, these are the treasures you're going to reveal. And he went out, and he found this treasure in a cliff face. And he retrieved it, but he never opened it. He kept it for a while. Uh, and then he went back out to a different cliff face and concealed it again. He said, it wasn't time for this treasure to be revealed. So I'm not going to reveal this one. He revealed a whole lot of treasures, but he didn't reveal this one. And so he put it back in the cliff face where it sat for, what, another 500 years 
until uh, the great Jamyang Chensei Wangpo uh, was riding uh, on his way from Lhasa to Jimpu. And a, a, this, a, a woman, an old woman came up to him and said, uh, you need to go look in that cliff face over there. There's something for you over there. And uh, so he went over there and he, re he retrieved the treasure that was hidden by Dream Kunga. And he also then uh, ordered, he decoded it using the Dakini script as is usually done. And he ordered, he had a woodblock copy made of it. But he didn't even, but he didn't include it in his uh, compendium, of, the compendium of Terma that he made called The Vault of Valuable Treasures. And then in 1996, Dr. Janet Gatza, whom you may know from uh, a book she's written about Tara, for instance, uh, discovered the copy of the woodblock at the public library in Lhasa in central Tibet. And she offered the text to Kenshin Paulden Sherab, who is a uh, Yingma Lama who uh, Padma Sambhava Center in upstate New York. I'm going to hope to go visit him in the spring. Uh, and he edited the electronic version uh, for the translation, which was begun in 2015 and published in 2017. And what they say about this text is that it's written in very archaic language, like it's a really difficult text to translate because it's written in archaic Tibetan. Uh, it was translated by, uh, you know, uh, Chonyi Kunga and Zongzar Zhangmyang Chensei wrote a forward to it. And there are a whole bunch of uh, practitioners who uh, contributed to this, including uh, the consort of, you know, my teacher, uh, my first teacher, uh, Chagda Rinpoche, Chagda Khandra. So now we get into, how much time have I used that? Okay, not too bad. We get into her uh, life a little bit. This is from Jengong Control's uh, very brief life of her uh, of Yeshe Tsogel, that you can get at Lutsawa House. And I'm only going to do these first four lines, the first stanza of this. Samantha Bhadri, unchanging goodness. Prajna Paramita, perfection of wisdom. Dat Vishbari, mother of all encompassing space. Bhadri Yogini. Sarasvati, goddess of learning. Yeshe Tsogel. Wisdom Queen of the Lake, Dakini, inseparable from the Guru's three kayas, to you we pray. So you see here, Jangang Kontral is saying that Yeshe Tsogyal is Samantha Bhadri, Prajna Paramita, Dat Vishwari, Vajri Yogini, and, and Sarasoti, Sarasvati. And so here uh, is a picture of Kunta Zangmo, Samantha Badri. And she's usually seen in, uh, like, the picture to the left here. That's Samantha Badri in union with Samantha Badra. That's the primordial Buddha. Buddha. Samantha Badri is the essence of all of the Dakinis. Uh, Samantha Badri is the, is the Dakini essence, the unadorned essence of all Dakinis. And Yeshe Tsogyal is Samantavadri. And of course, you know, you probably all know Prajnaparamita from the Heart Sutra, if nowhere else. There's Prajnaparamita in a statue form. And then on the left, I'm sorry for the quality of this, it didn't come through on the PDF as well as I expected. Uh, is Virochana, who is the uh, Buddha family Buddha of the five Dhyani Buddhas. That's Dat Vishvari is his consort. Uh, so she she is one of the primary Buddhas of Tantra, and uh, Chetogyal is no different from her. And of course, most people know Vajra Yogini. Here's Vajra Yogini in a dancing posture. There are, of course, many other representations of Vajra Yogini. 
And then I chose an Indian rather than a Tibetan version of Saraswati, because in India she's uh, worshipped more as a, just a straight up goddess than she is in Tibet. But Yeshi Tsogyal is uh, often depicted as Saraswati. Uh, the Tibetans don't can't really say the V sound, so uh, they they don't say Saraswati, and I tend to say it the way they've said it, which is with the, with the V being pronounced more like a W or an O. And so this uh, Yeshe Tsogyal here, and the first one, I'm going to go back up here. This Yeshe Tsogyal depiction also is from Samye, where a lot of recent activity has happened of uh, people painting murals back and restoring a lot of things at Samye, which is the first monastery uh, in Tibet founded uh, by Guru Rinpoche, Yeshe Tsogyal, Shantarakshita, and King Tret Trisong Datsun. And so here's one more source, uh, which is, uh, there's a website called I am Yeshe Tsogyal, I am Yeshe Tsogyal .com. It's really only one page, but it's got a lot of pictures and stuff from there. And this is a mural that's at Samye. And this also is from Samye, this Yeshe Tsogyal here. That's a statue of her at Samye. Obviously a pretty recent version of a statue. And so the, the two main terma sources that I've given are the two books uh, from the Gandharva's Lute Song and uh, the more recent one, <laughs> which I forget already. Uh, they, it, uh, they, they, they have some disagreement uh, about some of the details of Yoshi Sogyo's life. But in general, in general, they're in agreement. Uh, you know, she was uh, born as a princess. Uh, from early youth, she, she simply had no interest in worldly affairs of any kind. She had no interest in in the kingdom, she had no interest in getting married. She had no interest in doing anything except practicing Buddha Dharma and attaining enlightenment. Um, and of course, as the a female member of the royal family or any any child of a, ro a royal family, it was her duty to marry somebody to you know bring about an alliance with uh, another kingdom that would be beneficial to the kingdom. Uh, and so her father, against her wishes, her father promised her in marriage to a prince uh, with her mother's full support. Her mother was no no friendlier about it than her father was. Um, and she, at first, uh, she refused. She just simply said, no, I'm not going to do that. And uh, in one of the stories, her father says, well, you know, I made this promise and we're going to wind up at war and all the people are in an uproar because, you know, we're going to wind up at war with this other kingdom because you're refusing to marry them. She says, well, I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to do it. And so then this other prince also wanted to marry her. All these guys wanted to get married to Yeshe Tsogyal. She didn't want to marry anybody. And her father finally said in the one story in the loot of the Gandharvas, he says, go ahead. Okay, fine. You go ahead. You run. If you can get away, fine. But if they can catch you, whoever catches you, they get to keep you. And so she ran, and the first guy that he promised her to caught her, and they, she, they, they were dragging her back in chains uh, to his court. She hadn't married her yet, but, and she managed to escape. And she ran away again. This time they caught her, and they were much less friendly about it than the first time. They uh, they beat her. They stripped her naked. They beat her. They dragged her through, dra dragged her around in chains, beating her with thorns. They threw her in a dungeon. They were going to kill her. They decided it was time to execute her because she was being intractable. She wouldn't do her duty. She was treasonous. She she the kingdom was going to suffer and. Deals had been made and deals hadn't been followed through. 
But through the intervention of various people at the court, uh, her father decided to send her into exile. And she went into exile. Now, that there are, of course, there are differences in the story about the details of how this happened. And one, one story, she winds up, she's in exile, and Guru Rinpoche basically finds her through other people, and she goes into retreat. Another story, she somehow winds up becoming engaged or possibly married to King Trisong Detson, although there's nothing in the historical record of her actually marrying Trisong Detson. But in this story, she becomes one of his queens, and then he offers her as a concert to Guru Rinpoche. That's the most widely circulated story, actually, but the other one's more believable to me. Um, So she does. She goes in, in Chimpu, she goes into retreat for 12 years. Now, see, this is the thing. You can tell all of that other story in, for, for a fairly brief period because, you know, we're talking, she's not even 20 years old by the time, you know, she goes into retreat. We don't know how old exactly she is, but she's pretty young. She might even be younger than that. She might be 16. I don't know. Um, so she goes into retreat for 12 years. She's still pretty young, even when she comes out of retreat. But Guru Rinpoche now is her teacher. And not only does he teach her, you know, how to, how to do shamatha meditation, he takes her through the entire path. He not only takes her through the entire path, he transfers the lineage of the entire path to her. So she becomes the first true lineage holder of Guru Rinpoche in Tibet, as well as his consort, and as well as the first enlightened person of Tibet. Uh, all the way through. So she is a Dzogchen master in virtually all of the uh, Dzogchen lineages in one way or another have wind up coming through Sogyo Rinpoche because of this. Uh, after she achieved enlightenment and after she uh, emerged from retreat, she traveled throughout Tibet teaching and uh, planting, term, hiding, hiding terma uh, in various places all the way through Tibet. And then after Guru Rinpoche left Tibet, and of course she recorded his teachings also, much like as Ananda did for Shakyamuni Buddha. And after Guru Rinpoche left Tibet, she became, of course, one of the, you know, main teachers of Buddhism in Tibet. And, of course, it's very, you know, this is a period of time, in a way, it's very much like ours, our situation here right now. I mean, she, this, is, this is the Tibet that was a major empire. This was a, 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 it had the most powerful military possibly in the world at that time. Tibet, Tibet was uh, a force that was feared by the entire, all of Asia was worried about the Tibetan military. Uh, it was run by, it was run by a religion that was, uh, uh, that was antagonistic to the Dharma, to, to, to Buddhism. They, they didn't want Buddhism there. Uh, there was no support for mon monastics. There was no support for going on retreat for 12 years. In fact, you know, Yeshe Tsogyo was considered a dirty, nasty traitor. She was, she, you know, how dare she go and do this? You know, go and join this weird religious cult or whatever the hell it is and turn her back on the people of Tibet. And so that brings me to my main question for you. If you can go read all of those details of her story, I encourage you to, if you have a chance. I think you might find it inspiring and also uh, educational, but uh, okay, she's born like a princess, much like Shakyamuni Buddha was born as a prince, and much like him, you know, she didn't also didn't want to be a princess, he didn't want to be a king, she didn't want to, however, she was earlier, she, she, she came to these conclusions very early, but he wound up getting married, he went through, followed through, got married, and had kids, of course, there was no Buddha Dharma already there for him. He, just, so he had a somewhat different situation anyway, but she had a worse situation in a different way. She was a, a, a woman in the midst of this uh, 
you know, uh, tribal uh, patriarchal culture. And she was expected to do certain things. And so her choice was to become, to go against her culture and to follow the Buddha Dharma. So what do you think? Do you think it's, you take it to your life, is it uh, when if you decide you're not going to follow the things that our culture thinks you should follow, you're not going to do the, you're not going to be, you know, not going to work the kind of, you're not going to uh, try to do a great, a big career. You're not trying to, you're not trying to, you know, have great pros, any kind of, you know, a lot of money or a lot of possessions or whatever. If you're not, you get married, have children, follow through with, have, you know, establish your own little kingdom. If you're, or do you think it's selfish not to do that? Is that become, is that a selfish thing then? Or to, to actually, devote your entire life to the Dharma instead of devoting your life to our cultural values? Or uh, do, you, do you think that uh, if, if, you, if, you're, if you're following the Bodhisattva path and you, and, and, and you, you, you have taken this vow to uh, liberate all beings, now is it better for liberating all beings? Should you become a, a social worker? Is that the best path? You know, are you, uh, should you give, is, is it, should you, should you focus on feeding people? Should you, or, or, or is, or, or is it actually practicing the Dharma and becoming enlightened? The number one thing that you can do to, uh, to help, to help the world and to help other people. So I'm going to uh, yeah, just go ahead and jump in, Karen. Yeah, I just want to say I, I don't think it's selfish at all to, to have the aspiration to become a Buddha. Um, you know, th that that actually is, is the highest aspiration, in my opinion. Um, the thing that was difficult, you know, for me personally, I didn't, you know, meet Lama and... Uh, began, you know, really learning the Dharma until I already had three kids and my youngest one was like seven or eight years old. So it's like I, I felt a responsibility, you know, to finish um, helping, you know, grow, get my kids grown up. Um, and so it's funny because now I look at, okay, well, I'm retired and my kids have moved out. So what is, you know, clearly, it's clear to me now what my priorities are in life and my priority is you know to to fulfill that aspiration if i have enough time <laughs> left in this life or at least make some headway toward it so it's really um hard in this culture because a lot of us that were not raised buddhist or, or not even exposed to that at all um you know and i wasn't until i was in my 40s so um i'd be curious to hear what other people think too I know in my experience, just uh, well, even now, it's hard. It's hard for me to uh, really have confidence, strong, full confidence, that when I sit down to meditate, that I'm actually doing more for people than I could do through any other activity. It's very difficult for me to, sometimes I can see that and sometimes uh, I don't. Go ahead, James. Uh, you're on mute, James. Thank you. Can you hear me now? I just upgraded my wireless. So uh, that was a plug for Verizon, but um, a really great talk and subject and love the way you unfolded it. And um, I just want to take a second to just say, you know, patriarchy is whacked. I mean, to take a young girl and force her to do something she doesn't want to do to marry somebody. And I know that happened to princes too, but um, 
in our culture, just the dichotomy of the genders and how things, uh, you know, if you're one gender, you just kind of get away with stuff. And if you're the other gender, you have just this mountain to climb up even to follow a high ideal, I think is something that really needs to be worked through in every aspect of our society. And I, I know even in spiritual circles and even in the highest levels of, you know, medical or social work or therapy, it's just inundated with patriarchy. And I think it's just really unfortunate because I think it really limits a lot of people um, from really expressing who they are. And I think when somebody really expresses truly who and what they are, that is the magic, whatever that is that's drawing them. And it may be really kind of confusing to look at it from the outside or with whatever value system is in fashion at that time. Um, but I think it's a super important talk. I'd like to see a lot more talks about um, the feminine psyche um, and other psyches in Buddhism. Would anyone like to respond to that? Um, hey, Dirk, it's Martha. Hi, Martha. Um, I don't have a response to uh, what James just said, although I appreciate it, but I have a response to what you shared because I know that you're deeply devoted to this path and I really appreciate your honesty in sharing that sometimes you really struggle with that question of how can I be of greatest benefit? And as a person who um, from a very young age, I, um, have never been interested in doing the mainstream cultural thing. Like I've known from a very young age, I don't want to get married. I don't want to have kids. Um, I want to devote my life to following the path that is authentic to me and trying to be of benefit. Um, but even, uh, even not having engaged with those things and then maybe found the spiritual path, um, I still really struggle with that question, too. Um, and I think maybe more important than answering that question is just being able to hold space for that question within ourselves on an ongoing basis, because maybe at some times the best things that we can do are our practice. And maybe at other times we do need to engage more directly with the world. Um, I know the Dalai Lama talks about how sometimes, you know, meditation and prayer aren't enough. So I just uh, want to thank you for bringing up that question and, and sharing so um, honestly your experience with it. And great talk. Thank you. Uh. Go ahead, Doug. I was going to say something, but I said enough today already. <laughs> right. I noticed for me, uh, it's a balance between doing practices and being involved in the world, so to speak. Uh, more practices I do, the less the world seems like the world, too. It seems to be, you know, part of uh, Dharmakaya. When I was younger i didn't have an interest in enlightenment or anything for that matter and doing practices awakened me to what my path should be which is being involved with people being involved with family especially and after a while i think you notice intuitively what is just materialistic or what is being forced on you as opposed to what is really your path and helping yourself and everyone at the same time and it's not always easy but usually intuitively sometimes you can get a sense of too much this too much that when you need to get away and when you need to do more either working with people or doing practices i think it's different than for her when she uh was being forced to marry someone that's like completely the opposite of this. 
going against her path. Well, that's basically it. Uh, on the other hand, when she did follow the path, she went into a 12 year retreat. There was no question of yeah. balance, you know, in terms of, oh, I'll do a little of this and a little of that. It was all 100%. Yeah. In that case, that, probably, that was the best thing to do. She wouldn't have been helping anybody by not doing that. Go <laughs> ahead, Connor. Hey. Um, so this is actually a question that I, I answered for myself about a year ago. Um, I was applying for jobs and couldn't find a job and basically went into inter interviews and what came out of my mouth was the my actual real impression of what those jobs would mean for me and for my life. And of course that doesn't go over well in an interview process. Um, so I had to reevaluate what I wanted to do or how I wanted to use my skills. And for me, um, that was actually talking with Lama Law about following a monastic path. Um, so that's hopefully my plan at this point is that I can use those skills and, and what I can do to help others through that path, which does involve meditation and, and prayers and stuff. But partly for me, what that means is learning about enlightenment and learning about the two truths and the vulnerable, um, basically about suffering. So then I can help more people better, right? The, the more I work on myself, the more I can, I have to give. So, you know, it's not a very, it, it's actually probably the hardest path that I could possibly do at this point, but um, it just seems like the right one for me. So I think that people really sort of need to look into what is the right path for them and then see within that path how they can or how they are helping others. So there's a lot of ways that we help each other. It's not just by prayers or meditation, but helping ourselves can actually help others. Um, I can't, if I can say a couple more things, Connor, I think that's a wonderful thing. That was one thing I was going to say is I do believe that those who take the monastic path are taking the highest path. Um, because as you know, the, the, you know, to really truly help people in the best way, we need to be enlightened and beings in order to fully help people in the best way. And the, everyone's path to that might be a little bit different, but that's why we have a teacher so that he can help us, you know, guide us um, in, in that what's the best path for us so that we can attain enlightenment and be of most benefit uh, to other beings. Hi, everyone. This is Dana. I was wondering if I could add my comments. Um, I think I think in some cases, the um, the two questions there, um, since you know, um, I think women can do it all. I don't think it needs to be a decision uh, either way. Um, I don't think it's it's selfish, you know, to to seek enlightenment in certain ways. But I I do think that Lama would say that you know, there's certain times in our lives when you know things certain things are appropriate and we're ready for the path and, you know, um, when there's other things to do, I, I, I'd actually see it differently. I think, um, uh, I think it's harder to stay in the world, uh, to, to actually go through, um, samsara and, and still practice and, and raise our kids and, and take care of our families. Um, I think that's, that is a really hard path to go and it's a worthy path and i think we we you know like many people say you know we we study the dharma and we're kind of like fountains and we kind of splash things on to other people and and we try to do our best in the everyday you know activities i think that is 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 really important and certainly yes we can't uh do as much good as we could if we were enlightened but um I think the hard the hard job is to stay in the world and to stay committed to the the 
the things that, you know, are in our lives um, now and to try to make them better and to try to work within the system in some cases, I mean, whatever context you want to use, but um in many cases, some cases, yeah, of course, it's better just to disengage from it and and let it go. But um, I think it's harder to stay in the world. So for parents who who want to, you know, um, have their kids grow up so they can finally get to the studying of Dharma, I think parents are doing the most incredible work that they can do is, is raising little Buddhas that Lama talks about, you know, that's incredibly important work. Um, so... Um, I, I think I think as women we can do both. Uh, I don't know what men can do, but <laughs> I choose both, and I don't think it's selfish to do to do both. Thanks, uh, Patty. I'm going to save you for last because you have a message from Mama. But go ahead, Roberto. Roberto. Hi. Yeah, it's a beautiful story. I I just wonder. There is so little that we know about the story, right? It's so hard to, to know. But like uh, when she decided not to marry and go against the, the interest of the kingdom, she was not enlightened yet. So uh, it's, it's kind of, I'm saying, but it's more a question if she was not enlightened. So she's just doing whatever she feels like is the right thing to do. And uh, and I relate to that because I don't know the answers of for everything in my life. What's the best way? What's the right thing? I agree with Dan and that we cannot choose or we don't have to choose between one thing or another. But uh, there is no right right and wrong or, or right right and left. It's more like um, if you if your attitude, what what's your attitude towards like she could get married and and search for enlightenment and see this as an act of compassion for the people of of her of her kingdom or she could leave and 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 see that as a as an act of no attachment to to whatever people expect of her so i don't see right or wrong but we know so little about her we would be love to to know to know more about it Thanks. Yeah, that's uh, that. I remember when I was young. I remember, especially when I was young. Anyway, talk talking to people who seemed to always know, like they had a rule, a book of rules that they could just follow. And I always, I would go, God, I wish I just had a book of rules that I could just follow. That I, I walk into a situation, and I go, Oh, well, that's obviously the right way to go, because I, I, I've never. You know, it's always, it, it, like you said, it's, it, it, what's the right way? I don't know. <laughs> I just do the, do the best I can. But in our culture, I, I think what I was addressing wasn't whether or not someone should do what Yeshe Sogyal did. Uh, but, you know, when, when, when a monastics are walking down the street and people are throwing the things at them saying, get a job, <laughs> Um, it, it becomes a very difficult, uh, it, it shows how difficult the culture is to counteract uh, in terms, because, because the Buddha Dharma, even though, you know, forget about, I'm not talking about commitments to family or to helping other people, but to have the intention of that is greater than simply having my own stuff my own family my own world things the way yet the 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 quotidian life i'm not I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with it but but i think in our culture it's very difficult to not feel that you're wasting time by practicing a spiritual path anyway that's 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 what I'm always uh, kind of in struggle with, and maybe it's more of a male thing. Maybe it's more of a male problem. I don't know. I don't know if it is. Turk, I think you're. I think you're right when you, you talk about devaluation of 
of somebody's work or intention. I think women have a, 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 a definite intimate uh, understanding of that aspect. And so um, women's work is always uh, in historically devalued and not seen as as valuable as, as men's work. And so I can see what you're saying is, yes, monks should get a job and, and work. Women were not, and maybe still even, um, considered to be uh, uh, required to work <laughs> in some cases. So um, I think it's, it's very, very unique um, connection that you made there. It's very interesting. Well, yeah, not only not required, but not allowed. Like my mother, my mother, for instance, experienced the opposite. She wasn't, a, my father told her he didn't want her to work, but then, mm. then he walked out on her. Mm. She had no job history. No yeah. job. She couldn't get a job. You know, so no, it's all it's all very complex. <laughs> okay, I, I think we're about running out of time. So, Patty. <laughs> yes. Um. Thank you, Dirk, for your talk. I always enjoy your talk so much. I learn every time. Learn, learn something. And um, I, I think about it afterwards for a long while, which is a sign that it's a really great talk for me at least. But um, while I was listening to you today, Lama texted me and that's quite rare actually. It's not a very everyday thing for me at least. And um, he, he wanted to share um, that he has a great appreciation for all the prayers and practices that all of you and me and people who aren't here do on his behalf and also he wanted to um, express his deep appreciation for those of us that are able to hold pure view of, of, of Lama or are gradually getting there and seeing our teacher as a Buddha and um, also last year in 2020 you know it's just so so difficult for so many of us and um, and if it weren't it wasn't difficult for us personally people that we love and cherish, it's difficult for them and that can truly impact us whether our lives are going well or not. And so, you know, just that we manage together to keep our temple, you know, our precious temple, the grounds that have been blessed by all these amazing visiting teachers and the very space itself, we haven't occupied it, but we've occupied it in our hearts, haven't we? Because wherever we go, um, if we are pra practitioners, we carry with us the, our temple because it's in our hearts, isn't it? But that space is really important. And Lama wanted to emphasize it's not an asset in the sense that it's so much more than that, including the tankas and just everything, because it's not about us, really. It's about our community and the future when we're not here anymore. And so he just wanted to express his gratitude. And um, just to think that he feels grateful, this makes me feel grateful. It's kind of just contagious, I feel. And um, so uh, that's just all. He just sent me kind of a long text. And um, I think it kind of fits with your question, Dirk, because, you know, Lama's given everything, everything to this path. And he's so inspiring in that, in that regard. And um, you know, for me, sometimes I feel like I'm giving everything, but then there's this little part of me that holds back because I get a little bit afraid along the way. But um, all of you have certainly helped me keep my courage alive. And um, I just wanted to share that on behalf of Lama, his gr gratitude and his emphasis that the temple is something to preserve. And that because of the generosity of people here and people who are not here, We've managed to do that up to this point. So um, he just wanted to express that, his, his gratitude. So that's that's all I have to share. And um, thank you for giving me a chance to do that. I, I Ina, I also like to share, I was walking around the temple the other day with Lama, and I think it's really, it's really easy for us to forget that the temple is just a brand new experience for us. It's been five years or so since since we were able to purchase the temple, but before that we were nomadically 
putting up tonkas if if all your old timers remember changing out the altar every every you know monday or sunday you know rituals what we have is so precious that we have a space that is our space and that we don't um have to have permission to go and and occupy whenever you know we want to do something special and someday we'll get back to that but Lama, you know, he cares for that space so much. He walks around, he sees every nook and cranny and <laughs> wants to fix things and, and do things. We just, you know, can't afford everything right now. But it's it's just such a precious thing to have our own space and our own uh, ability to express the teachings in the way that, that Lama envisions and Geshe-la envisions. So I just want to say thank you to all those um that helped support it because without you guys, we wouldn't have this incredible space, which someday we'll get back to. <laughs> I guess I, I should turn this over to Doug for closing prayers, unless someone else would like to say something. I've got one quick announcement. Just remember tomorrow at 7.30 will be Dalai Lama talking on the Heart Sutra day one of three rather than Buddha Dharma study program or Manjushri. Thanks. Thank Dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good all-powerful Chenrezig, Tenzin, Gyatso. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Sankapa, crown jewel of the Snowyland sages, Losang Drachma, I make request, at your holy feet. The verses that save Sakya from sickness. May all the diseases that disturb the minds of sentient beings and which result from karma and temporary conditions, such as the harms of spirits, illness, and the elements, never occur throughout the realms of this world. May all the diseases that disturb the minds of sentient beings, well, okay. May whatever sufferings arise due to the life-threatening diseases, which like a butcher leading an animal to the slaughter, separate the body from the mind in a mere instant, never occur throughout the realms of this world. May all embodied beings remain unharmed by acute, chronic and infectious diseases the mere names of which can inspire the same terror as would be felt in the jaws of Yama, Lord of Death. May the 80,000 classes of harmful obstructors, the 360 evil spirits that harm without warning, the 404 types of disease and so forth, never cause harm to any embodied being. May whatever sufferings arise due to disturbances in the four elements, depriving the body and mind of every pleasure, be totally pacified, and may the body have and mind have radiance and power, and be endowed with good with long life, good health, and well-being. 
by the compassion of the gurus and the three jewels, the powers of the Dakinis, Dharma protectors and guardians, and by the strength of the infallibility of karma and its results. May these many dedications and prayers be fulfilled as soon as they are made. Now I'm going to go out and shovel some snow. <laughs> Doug, you need to change your calendar. It's December. It's on December. You need January. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Hey, Dirk, this is Sue. I just wanted to say thank you for your teaching. It's always so inspiring to me. And I have read The uh, Life of Yeshi Yoga, and it's really helped me a lot. So, again, thank you, and good luck with the snow, because I remember shoveling that, too. <laughs> well, fortunately, it's not that much. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you, Dirk. Thank, thank you, Dirk. Thank you, Dirk. Uh -huh.